Thank you very much, Ted. It's always an honor once again to introduce Saskatchewan's Premier, the Honourable Brad Wall. On behalf of SUMA, our Board of Directors and our 440 member governments and the huge swath of population that we collectively represent, I want to thank Premier Wall for being with us this morning. We sincerely appreciate his time and that he values the relationship between his government and ours enough to appear before you today and then return again on Wednesday with his cabinet to take your questions. Mr. Premier, we look forward to continued work with you to make the heart of Saskatchewan beat stronger so that we can all have a prosperous future in this province that we all love so much. Fellow delegates, would you please join me in extending a warm SUMA welcome to our Premier, the Honor Honourable Brad Wall. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. President Button, thanks very much. Thank you. Good morning. You know, after all of these years, you might think that introductions aren't necessary. Even those of us in politics, Deb, might think that they're not necessary. But I was reminded recently that they're always helpful. Um, earlier this month, I spoke to the Canada West Equipment Dealers Convention that was being held here and uh, held in the capital city in Regina. And uh, the CEO for the organization was there to organize the event and ran into one of the hotel staff before the convention began in earnest and the hotel staff person said so do you have any speakers what what's the speaker lineup for your for your convention and the CEO said well we we got the premier and he said oh I, I'll hate to miss it I've always wanted to hear Ralph Goodale speak <laughs> it's Ralph Goodale so today I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the challenges that we're facing in the current budget uh, before us in the province, but also about the economy and where we're at in the where we think we're at in the near term, uh, the mid term, and the long term uh, in the province of Saskatchewan. But before I, I do that, I want to do, unfortunately, as I did last year, uh, and that is to thank those of you who were on the front line facing significant flooding uh, and disasters across this province. I think there were 95 communities that declared a state of emergency and the, and the people in this room again were on the front lines serving your citizens keeping them safe protecting them and so too were your emergency measures uh, personnel volunteers uh, it was also true of course of provincial uh, officials and workers across the province uh, and you know I happened to, uh, to tour a number of the the communities immediately after the flooding places like Melville and we are in Gainesboro, which was evacuated, as, as you will know, in Mooseman and Wolseley and Carndiff and Merrifield. Mooseman, I don't know, I think it got hit three times by the time it was all over in terms of heavy rain. Uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge the response from all of you and your organizations. Uh, I'd ask perhaps that you would, uh, would acknowledge as well your colleagues and confreres that were on the front line as well during this, uh, this spring of flooding. Gainsborough, as you know, was evacuated for some time, and we were in Carndiff down the road. I'm sure a, a rival community when it comes to sports, but boy, did they ever open up their arms when their neighbors were in trouble. They, we had a tour of EVAC Center, Jim Ryder and I did, and uh, I won't tell you about uh, the story that I could about when Jim uh, met a bee uh, or a wasp there at that particular event. I'm going to let him tell that story, but please ask him. If not after his speech, then during the bear pit session, that would be good. We were in, 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 uh, we were in, in Carndiff, and they had set up and opened this amazing evac center. There was a free store there with supplies for those who were coming over from Gainesboro and they had put a Facebook call out for clothing and there were literally tables full of, of clothes for, pe for kids, for people of all ages to be able to grab if, if they left Gainesboro without all of those things. They had a great kitchen there and they had room to accommodate all of those who were evacuated for, for nighttime, for sleep. And at least on that occasion, on that night, there was not one bed that was used in the evacuation center. And the reason was because the people of Carndiff opened up their homes and their driveways where they had RVs and nobody spent a night in the evac center. They were comfortable in the homes of their neighbors in Carndiff. And, uh, I, you know, these events are, uh, are serious when we face them. But they also remind us about the strength of this province, its greatest strength, and how we treat each other and I hope how we will continue to treat each other in Saskatchewan, notwithstanding what the price of oil might be or where we are in the economic cycle. 
So thanks to, uh, to all of you for that response. Um, I should also say a few words, if I can, before I get into the text of my remarks about the Supreme Court decision on essential services. It affects people in this room. It certainly affects the provincial government in terms of the delivery of services uh, in our province. Let us be very clear now that the ruling from the Supreme Court was on legislation that had already been changed by our government. We had already heard from a, a lower court in the province about concerns, and though we won at the appeal level here in Saskatchewan, we made changes anyway. We reached out to Labour and we consulted with Labour, and I'm, I know SUMA was part of the consultation, I think SARM was as well, and others in management, and we worked to find a solution that would accommodate concerns that existed with our essential services legislation in Saskatchewan. We think we achieved that, and that was not the subject of the court ruling, you should know, however, as the Minister has said publicly in the wake of that ruling, we're prepared to have a look at this current ruling of the court and find out if the legislation that exists today, the prevailing legislation, needs to be changed or amended. And if it does, we'll sit down in a consultative mode again and find the changes that will work. But what is, what is not subject to change, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that our government believes we must have essential services measures, essential services legislation in the province of Saskatchewan. I remember watching as an opposition leader the news unfold when union leadership, not union members, but union leadership at the time threatened to withdraw snowplow services as a blizzard was heading to the province. And I think we made public comment then and then after the 07 election that collective, right, uh, collective bargaining rights must always be respected. The bargaining rights of management must also always be respected. But first and foremost must be the public safety and the health of the people of the province of Saskatchewan, the people we serve, and we will have those measures in place in Saskatchewan. I have a thing in revenue sharing here. Should I just move right past that, Deborah? <laughs> so have you heard about this, this revenue sharing that's going around? <laughs> I do want to get into it a little bit with you. Uh, well, I don't want, no, I don't want to get into it with you. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't want that. I've already done that with your president. She's done a great job on that front, by the way. But I, I, I want to give you the context for some discussions we've had, some public musings and, and meetings the minister has had with his stakeholders on the, uh, on the issue of, of not just revenue sharing, but the budget. The context for, the, uh, for those musings and that discussion has become more clear in the intervening weeks. The revenue numbers are not yet finalized for the budget that will be delivered in March, but we have a pretty good understanding that the hit to oil and some other revenue changes that are happening that are somewhat attendant to oil and some unrelated will result in a loss of revenue to the government of Saskatchewan of between six and eight hundred million dollars. That's between five and seven percent hit to the revenues of Saskatchewan. Not a devastating amount, actually. Not when you consider what's happening in Alberta, but not an insignificant amount either. All of you administer governments. All of you have the challenge of putting together budgets. And in that, you want to balance the fiscal needs of the, of the future in your community, the principle of fiscal responsibility, but also you want to build for the future. You want to provide the best possible service to your citizenry that you can. And you know and I know there aren't any third parties out there or aren't any causes out there that are asking for less money in any given year. They'd like more resources if it was possible. And that's also understandable. But the reality is that this year we won't have the money to give more. Some will have to get the same as last year. Some will get less than last year. That's the context, by the way, when you hear me say, or ministers say, that everything's got to be on the table. It can't be everything but a certain group. It needs to be everything on the table, at least for consideration. That's the context, that's the genesis for the, uh, for the discussion and, and some of the uh, talk in the media that you've heard recently. Everything means everything. <coughs> Having said that, I believe though that the revenue sharing formula that exists today has worked well for our province. I think it's worked particularly well for municipalities. It's provided that 
revenue sharing you asked for. It's provided that consistency. Long before we came to office as a government, I heard you and, and members of the legislature, colleagues that have joined me, heard you say, we need stable revenue sharing from the province. We need to stop the cuts to revenue sharing that were happening, and we need stability, and we want the revenue to be tied to the government's own source revenue. And own source revenue is basically the money the provincial government collects minus the transfers we get from the federal government. The municipality said, quite rightly, we think revenue sharing should be just that. It should increase when that own source revenue is increased and it should decrease when the government's own source revenue decreases. We sat down after 07 and we hammered out what a formula might be to represent that principle. And we chose, and the provincial government chose, we chose one point of the PST. And one point of the PST has provided that stability for municipalities. You're able to budget, and you have budgeted this year on the basis of that. And by the way, I am very mindful of that. The government's very, very mindful that the budgets are by and large put to bed on the basis of that principle. We take that very, very seriously. That point was made very effectively, again, uh, by your president, Deb Button, in a phone conversation we had not too long ago. I hope you also understand that our government has worked hard to be the kind of government that does the, say, that does the things it says it will do, keeps the commitments that we've made. This is one of those commitments, to be sure. The best part of my job, ladies and gentlemen, is that there are many, many, many people in the province of Saskatchewan who are prepared to remind me of all of those commitments. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> people should expect elected officials at every level to keep their commitments. They should also expect their elected officials to respond to extraordinary circumstances and preserve and ensure the fiscal health of their jurisdiction. And the reality is we are facing a significant revenue shortfall, six to eight hundred million dollars. We are going to deal with it. We are going to drive towards a balanced budget. It's at the cornerstone of our growth plan. So what I could tell you today is that while everything is on the table, while the final decisions for the budget have not yet been made, President Button and your mayors and councillors and others, frankly, who are allies of this sector have made it very clear about the importance of the deal that we have and that consideration will be and is foremost as we head into the very final stages of the budget and I expect we'll hear more about it at the Bear Pit session. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, these challenges, the fiscal challenges though, they're the challenges of the government, actually, of our government, and hopefully, hopefully of all governments in the province. They do not necessarily, though, reflect the state of your economy. In fact, over the last number of years, we've seen a delinking, a decoupling in the relationship between the province's budget and the economy itself, and this is relatively new. The good news is that we have seen this delinking hap this de happen before in Saskatchewan in very recent history. We have seen a precipitous fall in the price of oil, a greater fall than what we just experienced. In fact, an 80% fall in 2009 from about 145 bu five bucks West Texas to around $33 was the low West Texas in 2009. And what was worse about that year, ladies and gentlemen, is that almost everything else was flat. There weren't any potash sales, frankly, to speak of. Potash sales collapsed after a record year the year before, making matters even worse. In fact, and you might have heard me tell this story over the last number of months, due to an anomaly in our potash royalty structure, we owed the potash companies money that year. I remember the finance minister at the time, Rod Ganifor, coming into the office and saying, Oil's collapsed, and by the way, there aren't very many potash sales to report to you, and moreover, because of this weirdness in our royalty structure, we owe the potash companies millions of dollars. And I said, well, that really sucks. <laughs> that was a technical term we use sometimes, and I think they use it in Treasury Board, actually. 
The bottom line, it was worse fiscally for the government then than it, than it is today. And what happened to the economy that year? Well, the GDP actually contracted, mostly because of potash sales, factoring into the measure. But what happened to the main street economy that you represent? What happened where you live? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Our entrepreneurs, our business people, continued to create jobs at a nation-leading rate. More people moved into this province. Our population grew. Capital investment increased into the province of Saskatchewan. And through that very difficult time, you and those you represent grew. This economy continued to ensure that it was a national leader. The next year, our economy was ready to take off and grew by 4.2 percent. And what, what happened to the budget, by the way? We balanced the budget. We deferred a few capital projects, but mostly we held back on operational spending. We didn't increase taxes. And we were able to balance the budget, and the economy remained strong. This year's different. This year, there is attendant strength in the potash industry. They're coming off a record year of 18.4 million tons sold. 2015 is looking pretty good for the potash industry as well, going forward. And agriculture is strong. You might have heard me say in the last number of years that agriculture in this province is, is a rock star in our economy, sometimes unsung because of the press and the ink that oil gets, that potash gets. But our exports in agriculture are growing. Because of agriculture, this province takes a dominant position in, across Asia, countries like Indonesia and India and all of the ASEAN countries and increasingly as well in China. Because of agriculture, I'm happy to announce today two mega projects in the province of Saskatchewan upcoming this year. And people who have served in government at any level will know how important mega projects. And governments used to chase them with taxpayers' money. We used to want to announce mega projects whenever we could. I've got two to announce today. One is seeding, $4.5 billion mega project, and the other is harvest. It's a $1.5 billion mega project, and they happen every single year. And our job, even in urban municipalities in the provincial government, is to recognize the strength that is in agriculture to guide us through times like we see even as resource prices move up and down. Agriculture and the other sectors of our economy are one of the reasons that we're expected to grow by over 2% this year, notwithstanding what's happened with the price of oil. And, and we've seen economic strength and momentum lately that will guide us through whatever choppy waters we face. This is the 24th month for Saskatchewan to have the lowest unemployment rate in the Dominion of Canada. This is the third year of $20 billion in additional investment in Saskatchewan, double the total in 2007. And while our numbers are still being finalized, we expect new records in exports, in manufacturing shipments, and in wholesale trade for 214. We have momentum, and increasingly we are diversified, ladies and gentlemen. This is very key for us to remember this morning and in the weeks ahead. Since 2007, there have been 65,000 or so brand new spanking jobs created in the province of Saskatchewan. Only 10% of those jobs are from the resource sector. There's new jobs coming from the trade sector, from the innovation sector, from financial services, and yes, from manufacturing. And you don't have to accept my opinion. Here's what Benjamin Tal, the Deputy Chief Economist for CIBC World Markets, had to say to the Leader Post recently, and I quote, Putting Alberta and Saskatchewan in the same basket is wrong because the situation here is different. Yes, absolutely, there will be a negative impact coming from the oil sector. But if you look at the structure of the economy in Saskatchewan, it's very different than the structure of the economy in Alberta. You still have agriculture, he's talking about us, you still have potash, and there is manufacturing. So what is our role then in this room what is the provincial government's role, if any, to keep Saskatchewan strong? To build on the momentum that exists, to not let it wane. You've probably heard me say that governments at any level don't drive the economy. But we sure set the tone. We create the right environment. We create the right business climate for those who are powerful job creators to, in which to flourish. The goal of our upcoming budget is, quite frankly, quite simply, to keep Saskatchewan strong. 
We're going to do that by following a number of principles. Notwithstanding the revenue crunch in the, in the budget upcoming, we are going to keep taxes low. Over the past seven years, the government has delivered the largest income tax reductions and the largest education property tax reductions in our history. We don't want to give ground on that front. Our government is committed to keeping tax as low as possible, and in fact, at the throne speech, we announced that in this budget, we'll introduce new growth tax incentives for new manufacturing jobs and also new corporate office jobs, and you may want to have your economic development people become aware of these as they're announced in the budget as a tool they can use to attract jobs from other jurisdictions or to create brand new jobs in the province. We will follow the principle of controlled spending operationally, but importantly, we're going to continue to invest in infrastructure. We have to, we must not make short-term decisions because of short-term circumstances we face. We need to continue to build infrastructure in the province. There may be some deferrals, there may be some delays, but our bias will be towards building. Our bias will be towards dealing with the infrastructure deficit that has not yet been eliminated, as you know well. Our bias will be towards being a meaningful partner for you through building Canada and any other vehicle we might be able to access to help you keep up with the challenges of growth. And we will use every arrow in the quiver to get this done. And yes, that includes P3s. I see Mayor Fouchere down on the front row here. I want to thank the City of Regina, but other communities for demonstrating that P3s can work, they can be transparent, they can save money, and they can get the job done now when we need to deal with the infrastructure deficit. And following along in those principles, we intend to use P3s, and they will feature prominently through SASC builds in the budget and in the plan of the Government of Saskatchewan going forward. We are going to, as a principle as well in the budget, focus on training. We still have a labor shortage in this province, and while some have said uh, maybe a bit of a, a pause in oil might solve that problem, we ought to still be planning for the long term, and that means the investment in training seats, and that means pushing for more nominees into the nominee program where we've actually had some success with the federal government, and we thank them for that. To keep Saskatchewan strong, we're also going to be <clears throat> highlighting the... <clears throat> highlighting the importance of international engagement. For the first time in a long time, over the last number of years, through STEP, our businesses, and I hope our government, and frankly municipalities, we've been going to markets where we have great potential for growth, and we need to continue to do that, and we will. In this budget, we will also talk about furthering our innovation agenda, building the next economy, investments like the Global Food Security Institute, Investments like the Manufacturing Center of Excellence, or BD3 that you just heard about from SAS Power. We will also remain focused on competitiveness. We will look to cut red tape in the province. We'll look to cooperate with all other provinces and find deals to improve trade between the provinces, where we still have unnecessary barriers. But lastly, and most importantly, the principle going forward for the government and the budget as we deal the, with these times is to not give up ground in the area of fiscal probity, of fiscal responsibility. We will drive to balance the budget. I have been counseled by many who've said, well, now is the time it's okay for you to run a deficit, a big deficit. We are going to work hard to resist that temptation because running the deficit is one thing, getting out of it is quite another. Uh, and the cornerstone of our growth plan, the ability for us to make infrastructure investments, to reduce taxes for the sustainable long term, the basis for all of that, the foundation, is, is a balanced budget. That's why a AAA credit rating from two different agencies in New York is important to us. It underscores the fact that we're on the right track to ensuring that the finances today are right for what we want to do, but also what we're leaving to the next generation is better than what we found. And so, fiscal responsibility will be at the cornerstone, even as we deal with issues like infrastructure investment and revenue sharing for our municipal partners. Ladies and gentlemen, I noted earlier that uh, in 2009, when the fiscal situation was worse, that our entrepreneurs from within and from outside our province, they kept 
going full speed ahead. They kept creating jobs and opportunity in Saskatchewan. I hope we remember that in, in elected office, that that's the key, really. That's the key to everything we want to do. We need people to have the economic freedom and liberty and the confidence to create even one new job. Small and medium and large businesses, if they have that liberty, if they have that freedom and they create that one new job, the tax base will expand and things get a little easier for your budget and a little easier for mine and we can make those quality of life investments that we want. We can have this virtuous circle instead of the vicious cycle that we used to have. May we all be about creating that liberty for those jobs to be created. Because there are amazing people out there who are still doing amazing things in this regard. And let me just conclude by introducing you to one of them. Her name is Marie Ann Fournier, and she lives in Momart, Saskatchewan, Canada, where she and her husband Rick operate Sisters Boutique and Bistro. Marie Ann grew up in Momart, but like many in Saskatchewan, she had to leave. And her and her husband eventually settled in Wetaskiwin, where they lived for more than a decade. Now, 10 years is a long time, and you'll have I'm sure fam family uh, uh, members who have been gone that long and it's just that much harder for them to come back. But Marie Ann always wanted to come back to Saskatchewan. And the longing grew only stronger when her mom died. She wrote recently, I couldn't bear the thought of our family home and the blood, sweat and tears that my parents had put into developing a barren piece of land into gardens, an orchard, grotto, patio, flower gardens, etc., leaving the family. This was not going to happen on my watch. My roots were calling me home. And so Marie Ann could come home. There was a restructuring at her husband at Rick's company and they were able to come home. And she and Rick have now built a business there. And they've contributed in many other ways. Marie loves folk music. So Marie Ann decided to start a folk music festival in Momart, Saskatchewan. It's called, and I've got to be careful here, the All Folked Up Festival. <laughs> when I was in high school, I worked at a radio station. And um, on the weekends, when I would get a shift, we had a folk time, couple, three hours of folk, sometimes Saturday, sometimes Sunday morning. And when I read this name of this festival, I immediately thought of a folk song and a, an eternal fear that I have since those days of saying the wrong word into the microphone when I was trying to say the right word. And the fear was originally born of an Irish Rovers song called, here we go, I'm not a pheasant plucker, I'm a pheasant plucker's son. And I would always go very deliberately knowing that on their way to church, my mom was probably listening and probably the pastor. <laughs> Marie Ann started the All Folked Up Festival. First festival, a handful of people showed up. Last year, there was 700 plus that attended. And tickets are on sale right now, but you better grab them because once they get to 1,000, they'll be sold out. There remains for us still after all of these years of remarkable growth in Saskatchewan, there remains for each of us in this room and this government, our government, a lesson in the story of Marie-Anne Fournier. Over the last few years, the people of Saskatchewan have built something beautiful. By dint of their own hard work and their perseverance, they have built a resurgent province, finally living up to its vast potential, finally living up to its creeds, finally a place to stay, finally a place to come home to, finally the place to be, finally a strong Saskatchewan. We're going to keep it that way. See you on Wednesday.